please remember to leave a like, a comment, share the video about, and if you haven't already, subscribe. Thank you. Well, isn't this just fantastic? Captain's Log, Supplemental. The ISO cubes now inhabit one completely full cargo container that is tucked away underneath one of the full-sized ISO cube cots in our brig. It was, to be honest, either that, or Keister stashing it within the NPC crew. Welcome everyone to the Halls of Injustice. Today we welcome inmates number 161 to the ISO cubes. Inmates number 161 is essentially going to be spending the rest of their life with us. So consider that your trigger warning. Inmates number 161 is a dickhead. Deserving of their place in an ISO queue. Not deserving of any iota. A fraction. A molecule of freedom. Liberty. Humanity. Inmates number 161's name is Thomas Cashman. For this video, I'm going to tell you a little bit about him. It. A little bit about its crimes. Okay, all of that actually. The trial, the conviction, and we're going to address the law itself, although that will be fairly short. The crime itself carries a minimum tariff of one sentence. Yes, that's the nature of this game today, folks. Inmates number 161's crimes were so well known in the United Kingdom that they were trending on the YouTube homepage. I have a number of videos taken from that, all covering him when he was sentenced. I might play a few clips, We'll see how we go. If they're not in the video though, it's because more than likely copyright says apparently I'm not allowed to use it even if it falls under fair use. Thank you YouTube for not supporting your creators. So let us now begin with who is inmates number 161, aka Thomas Cashman. Thomas Cashman is a 34-year-old man from West Derby in Liverpool. He, at the time of his arrest, lived on a random, generic, boring-ass housing estate where he was seen most of the time walking his dog. His neighbours would regularly hear him playing with his daughter in their garden, spending time with his girlfriend who ran a nearby beauty salon. However, this normal life was a facade. He was actually an enforcer for one of the UK's most powerful and secretive crime groups, who had made a name for themselves on Merseyside, he himself a name as a terrifying hitman. The Hoyton Mafia work with the Kinahan Cartel, an Irish-based drug gang now hit with a raft of sanctions by the US government. Police and UK's FBI have been at war with the clan, rooted across Stockbridge Village, Hoyton, Croxteth, and West Derby for the past decade. Enemies were tortured to unalive and families were, well, boom, yeah? Cashman was regarded as the gang's protege, trusted with the task of enforcing the will of feared godfathers and until the arrest, he was a key figure. Two weeks before he committed the crime that got him put in prison, he was linked to an unsuccessful drive-by at Ackershole Park, yards from the family home of the victim he harmed. Well, the victim that put him in prison, that is. The target on that night was rival gang member Joseph Nee. Nobody was injured, but bullet cases recovered from the scene on August the 8th were then used in the crime that got him put in prison. Years earlier, Cashman's name was mentioned after the gangland shooting of Carl Bradley, whose body was discovered in a garden on Penshaw Close, just around the corner from Kings Heath Avenue where his more recent victim lived. See how it's localised? An underworld source claims he was known for being ambitious, violent and unafraid to pull a trigger. This insider first met Cashman in 2018 and he told The Telegraph he can't fight with his hands but he could use a gun, and he was willing to use a gun anywhere on anyone. Basically, his main line of work was being an enforcer alongside people doing cannabis grows. And every time these cannabis grows got robbed, he would be recruited by the people that were growing them to do the damage. Cashman would boast he was earning at one point up to £250,000 a year selling weed, and having a reputation for driving high-powered sports cars, hence this rather cringy picture. This information should be enough to tell you what you need to know about him. This is your last chance, by the way. The crime he committed involves a child. There's your spoiler. If you don't want to hear that, smash like on the way out, because now we are going to talk about the crimes of inmates number 161. At 10pm on the 22nd of August 2022, Olivia Pratt Corbell's mother, Cheryl, heard a disturbance outside the family home in Kingsheath Avenue, Dovecot, and then opened her front door 
with her daughter stood behind her. Joseph Nee, a member of a rather well-known organized crime group that I spoke about in the previous segment, and one of two men fleed from an unknown gunman, attempted to force himself into her home. While Nee attempted to enter the house, the gunman who was wearing a balaclava and a black jacket approached the house and shot four times. One of those bullets went through Cheryl's wrist and straight into her daughter's chest. Unfortunately for Olivia, she passed away at Alderhey Children's Hospital. Joseph Nee walked away from both Olivia and Cheryl to get in an escape vehicle, which was a black Audi. The next day, he was arrested for breaching his license conditions and was returned to prison because at the time, he was on license having served half his sentence in prison for being a convicted drug dealer and burglar. It's nice to see how he treats a mother and a dying child. Very respectful. On the 25th of August 2022, a 36-year-old man was arrested on suspicion of the murder of Olivia and two counts of attempted murder from his flat in Highton. The inquest heard that a police officer attempted to save Olivia's life after the shooting. On the 30th of August, two men were released. On the 1st of September, the Merseyside police released CCTV footage of the gunman. On the 4th of September, one man was arrested on suspicion of murder and two others detained on suspicion of assisting an offender. On the 7th of September, they were bailed. On the 8th, another man arrested. A ninth was arrested on the 10th of September. On the 29th of September, police arrested a 34-year-old man on suspicion of murder. On the 30th, a man was arrested on suspicion of assisting an offender. A lot of people were suspected in this. This is how deep the rabbit hole goes, folks. On the 1st of October, Thomas Cashman was charged with the murder, along with two counts of attempted murder, as well as two counts of possession of a firearm with intent to endanger a life. Another man, Paul Russell, was also charged with assisting an offender. The two men appeared at Liverpool Crown Court on the 3rd of October. How they managed to get to Thomas Cashman was that they had received a tip-off from a former partner who lived nearby and he had visited shortly after the murder. She recounted that he arrived in a panicked state and was asking for a change of clothes. When she originally came forward to the police about hearing about the child murder on the news, she was arrested on suspicion of assisting an offender. Before the police realized she held crucial information and was willingly cooperating. There was independent evidence to corroborate her account, as the clothes she said she gave to Cashman were then recovered hidden inside a pram box in Cashman's sister's home with his DNA on them, along with gunshot residue found on the leg of the tracksuit bottoms. The woman also recounted overhearing Thomas Cashman saying something along the lines of, I've done Joey to Paul Russell, her partner. Paul Russell would later plead guilty to assisting Cashman by driving him away from the address and disposing of a bag given to him by Cashman, which he believed contained clothes. But there's more. Other evidence gathered against Thomas Cashman was the existence of CCTV, which showed him circling the area where the attack on Joseph Nee would later take place, showing him driving around in his van on multiple occasions and walking around the area on foot. It was believed that Thomas Cashman was carrying out reconnaissance of the area to look for Nee and determine whether he had parked his car by an address on that road which he had. CCTV had shown Cashman had driven his car, van, to the area from his own address at around 3pm and also that he had repeatedly returned to Mab Lane, where the home of the key female witness who would later testify Cashman rushed to after the killing was located. CCTV of the gunman that night also showed him wearing a pair of tracksuit bottoms that matched the style of and design of those worn by Thomas Cashman. When police searched Cashman's home, they also found hidden cables from missing CCTV recorders and also discovered that one of these had been reconnected on the 25th of August, days after the shooting. The recordings, though, were missing. Thomas Cashman did admit at the time that he'd been in the area that day as a drug dealer, but denied he was the gunman. The attacker had fired two guns that night against Joseph Nee. And in the case of Thomas Cashman, he had two guns at his address, a 9mm and a revolver. One of these guns was found by the police to have been linked to two previous shootings in the area, one of which involved a previous attempt to kill Joseph Nee only two weeks prior. Remember the shell casings I spoke of earlier? Yeah, this. Interestingly, Thomas Cashman was a suspect in that already, but they didn't have enough to lay the charges at his feet. Now they did. With this information, we now go to the trial. The charge is murder. I really don't need to touch the sentence too much, beyond saying it's a minimum mandatory of 25 years, if found guilty. Thomas Cashman appeared before Manchester Crown Court and pled not guilty to murder, attempted murder and other offences related. The prosecution alleged that Thomas Cashman had shot the convicted drug dealer Joseph Nee in the street 
before he had fled to Cheryl Corbell's home. She tried to block him from entering the house. The jury were then told how the bullet had gone through Cheryl's wrist and into her daughter. Thomas Cashman had said that this is not true. In fact, at the time of the shooting, he was at a friend's house counting £10,000 in cash and smoking a spliff. But he was undone when Paul Russell's partner, who gave the police the tip-off in the first place, took to the stand to retell what she had already said, that he had gone to her home saying, I've done Joey. Thomas Cashman's solicitor, barrister, protector, guardian, had told the court that he was probably one of the most hated people in the country, but that Thomas Cashman was not guilty. But just to put a little salt in the wound for Thomas Cashman, the woman, we're gonna call her Jane Doe, Paul Russell's partner, had for two years been having an affair with Thomas Cashman. Behind the backs of Paul Russell, but also behind the back of Thomas Cashman's partner, Kaylee Ann Sweeney. This has been going on for two years when exchanges of flirty messages on Instagram. I'm not even joking, here is a picture of that crap. The relationship had actually continued for many, many months, but soured after a pregnancy scare. In court, while it was claimed that she wanted to move to Spain with Cashman and set up an OnlyFans account, uh, she said that uh, she uh, denied ever wanting to have a relationship with a thug with a little willy. You poor thing, Thomas. Well, in prison, you can be a receiver, don't worry. After a few hours of deliberation, the jury found Thomas Cashman guilty of the murder of Olivia Pratt Corbell. The trial itself lasted three and a half weeks. It took three and a half hours at most for the jury to come back with a guilty verdict, which Thomas Cashman cried when they delivered it. With this, we are now going to go to the sentence of Thomas Cashman. As a spoiler, I approve of this sentence. Thomas Cashman, aka inmate number 161, decided not to appear in the dock for sentencing, and none of his family were present in court. The judge said that his failure to appear was disrespectful to Olivia's family. John Cooper Casey, who defended Thomas Cashman, said that he had not attended as he had claimed the Crown Prosecution Service were singing We Are The Champions following his conviction, and that Cashman was concerned proceedings were turning into a circus. Sentencing him in his absence at Manchester Crown Court, Mrs. Justice Amanda Yip, who we have discussed many times on this channel before, said a few things. The defendant has not acknowledged his responsibility for Olivia's death and so has demonstrated no remorse. His failure to come into court is perhaps further evidence of that. On count one, for the murder of Olivia Pratt Corbell, the sentence will be life imprisonment. The minimum term will be 42 years less the time the defendant has already spent on remand. That is an awfully long term. In fact, the judge had considered a whole life order. That's how serious she took this. But there are more sentences to pass, and I think you should get it directly from the judge's mouth. On count two, the attempted murder of Joseph Nee, the sentence is life imprisonment with a minimum term of 22 years. On count three, Wounding Cheryl Corbell with intent to do grievous bodily harm to another, the sentence is 10 years imprisonment. On counts 4 and 5, the firearms offences, the sentence is 18 years imprisonment on each. The reason Thomas Cashman did not get a whole life order was because the attack, while premeditated against Joseph Nee, was not directed at Olivia. My view, 42 years on its own, well, he's going to be there for a while, isn't he? He is 34 right now, he will be 76 by the time he is eligible for parole. Just before that was delivered, Olivia's mother and father gave impact statements to the witness box. Quoted as saying, this is from the mother first, I cannot get my head around how Thomas Cashman continued to shoot after hearing the terrified screams and utter devastation he had caused. He doesn't care. His actions have left the biggest holes in our lives. She went on to tell the court how life was so very quiet without her daughter, adding, I just can't cope with the silence, and that she spent every afternoon thinking about the end of the school day and that her sassy, chatty girl, who everyone adored, and that my mind keeps telling me that I've forgotten to pick her up from school. Olivia's father told the court that he was heartbroken and his nightmares about how she had died that won't go away. Speaking directly to the absent Thomas Cashman, he said, You have denied my beautiful girl Olivia her future. I will never see her on her wedding day, walk her down the aisle, and see her grow into the beautiful woman she was destined to become. We've been robbed of her future because of you. She will forever be nine. Perhaps 42 years isn't long enough, 